Hi, I'm Andy with Ecochan. We're excited uh, to be here today to talk about a singular batch of tea, somewhat of an anomaly in our uh, experience uh, in terms of its degree of traditional uh, style of tea making. Uh, this batch uh, was harvested from the basically the heart of Lugu Township, um, just up from the Farmers Association. Uh, by a friend who we are just recently getting to know a lot better. Um, to be totally honest, at first when we saw his big fancy factory and uh, the kind of level of, of representation he was doing, it wasn't, it wasn't our style. Uh, it was a little bit too pro to really uh, attract us in a personal sense. Uh, but luckily we had the opportunity to get to know the father of this family. Uh, uh, when we showed up for our friends who were preparing competition tea, they would invite him over to taste the tea and get his input on it. And slowly we saw that he's quite a mellow and humble guy. And, and uh, long story short, we showed up in his factory because he told us he was going to do uh, a traditional batch of tea in September. The raw produce, when I saw it being processed, uh, was nothing like I had seen before mainly because of the extent of uh, bug-bitten damage that uh, had been done to the leaves as a result of uh, them not using and not administering any pesticides during the summer growing season. They are conventional tea farmers. They normally uh, follow conventional farming methods. But for this pot of tea, uh, and the, after they uh, prune the trees after the spring harvest, uh, they allow the, tea, the new tea leaves to grow through the summer without any use of uh, pest control. And this batch was heavily uh, influenced by various pests. Uh, it was just scarred and bruised and gnarly and, and we're like, wow, this is, uh, this is a challenge for you guys. And they were all kind of laughing and uh, what they decided to do, father and son team, was to uh, process it or oxidize the leaves uh, in a similar fashion to the methods used to make oriental beauty. So they were really trying to push the leaves. The leaves were very uh, kind of stiff and stubborn, uh, not easy to deplete them of moisture. Uh, they were they kind of hardened, so they had to put them through a lot of processing. Uh, the father and son ended up naming this batch of tea that only it was an incredibly small amount of tea. The amount of time and effort they put into making it, uh, they were just kind of chalking it up to research and they uh, are proud of being able to make uh, traditionally made oolong tea as it perhaps was made 50 years ago or more. Uh, so their name for this tea is heavy labor tea, <laughs> heavy labor oolong tea. We decided to sweeten it up a bit and we're gonna call it labor of love oolong tea. Um, and because I was able to go to the factory that night and watch the final phase, basically the indoor withering and the uh, last uh, round of tumbling, and then finally the, the kill green stage and the uh, successive rolling, and I just went through the dryer once. One of the more technical aspects is when they did kill green, uh, they didn't dry the leaves uh, nearly as much as the standard to make uh, oolong tea. Uh, they allowed, they, they kept a significant amount of the moisture in the leaves. The temperature was lower, the time, the time of the, uh, the tumble drying was uh, less. And then they just took the leaves out, very supple still, put them through the half moon roller as they call it. It's a, a, a disc shaped roller uh, wrapped in cloth, or I should say, they put it in the steam box and in the roller. Then they put it through the drying machine without any temperature, just room temperature to really cool down the leaves. So their intent in this aspect, uh, or in, in this sense, was to allow a form of post-oxidation. They weren't killing the enzymes fully in the leaves in the kill green process, and they were allowing them to continue to oxidize through the night and into the next day when they would be rolled and then fully dried. 
Uh, I ended up leaving the factory at 3 a.m. I made an agreement with the father to meet him at the rolling factory early afternoon the next day. Uh, I went there. The rolling factory was delayed, I guess, or they were putting that very small batch to the end of the day. Maybe the dad decided he was just going to push the oxidation that long, let the leaves sit before they were fully processed. Uh, so again, uh, I didn't see the leaves that day. He promised me a very small amount of the produce, which was already ridiculously small. I didn't hear from him. I kind of chalked it up to, well, at least I got to see the processing. I wish I could, um, hopefully I'll get to taste it when I visit them. They'll have at least a sample to taste. Um, again, um, it's a quite a long story, but I, I finally met up with them and they're like, oh, when are you going to come pick up your tea? And I was quite touched. I was, uh, you know, I'm not a regular customer of theirs. Uh, we're just getting to know each other. But the father had put aside uh, a few kilos of this tea for me with my name handwritten on a note uh, with the name of the tea. It was really special. And so I went there yesterday to pick it up and tasted it with the father and the son. And we laughed again about the whole process and how much work they put into making such a small amount of tea. And we're here, uh, ready to share it with all of our fans. It's definitely got a bug-bitten sense to it, but it's not that heavy honey flavor that Concubine or Oriental Beauty uh, are known for. It's enate. It's leaves that were, that's the Taiwanese for bug-bitten tea. Um, and it's leaves that were affected by pests. And there is a character to it. Uh, in the aroma and particularly in the brewed tea. Um, I'll, I'll show the color next time. There's just a richness there that doesn't come from anything else other than bug bitten tea. So uh, there's a broad spectrum of bug bitten tea. You can imagine, I mean, it's an effect uh, caused by an insect and it just depends on what stage of the leaf uh, growth was, when it was affected by the bug, all kinds of things that are not actually traceable scientifically in my humble opinion. Um, but there is a character people will know and they'll say this is bug bitten. So along with the bug bitten uh, factor, the leaves were oxidized very heavily uh, in comparison to oolongs made in central Taiwan. And, uh, and then they were roasted, but not very much. Uh, Mr. Lin said that he roasted them three times at a lower than normal temperature for a total of 12 hours. That's like a third of the uh, amount of time that goes into roasting a, a traditional Dongding Oolong, for example. So I would consider it a light roast. There is uh, a character of roastedness, but it's very subtle and uh, mild. I think he was just trying to fix the leaves and bring out the, the flavor components uh, within them by giving them a bit of a toasting. You can see that it's quite reddish in color, uh, but it's quite transparent as well. Get another brew going here. Yeah, so I'm getting this kind of fruit wood uh, aroma coming off the brewed leaves right now, wafting in my direction, um, but not very sweet. It's kind of a, a fruit wood, like freshly cut fruit wood. Some stone fruit in there. It's very transparent. Uh, one of the things that impressed me yesterday when I first tasted it was there is obvious, uh, we would consider heavy oxidation uh, in this batch of tea. But it's very distinct in its flavor profile than the, the flavor that comes from tea processed as black tea or even red oolong, which is a combination of oolong processing and black tea processing. This is strictly traditional oolong tea making. And there's something about the, the oxidation that uh, keeps the, uh, it, it's cleaner. There's not this syrupiness to it. It's, it's rich and it's somewhat fruity, but it's got, a, it's got bitter legs that give it a clean finish. And it's just not that, that uh, thick, uh, kind of just a, a, a more general sweet character that comes from making black tea, typically. Yeah, definite roast there. Roast combined with heavy oxidation is 
what the tea is in its most fundamental sense. I, I love this kind of tea. <laughs> if I could find this every year, I would just, I would probably just want to sell this. It's just, to me, it's, it's the heart of it. It's the heart of oolong tea making as I personally know it in Taiwan and it's our favorite thing to represent. Uh, so we got to just accept the fact that we only have a literal handful of this tea to share. We think uh, it's very worthwhile for especially the serious oolong heads out there to have a taste of this tea. Um, it's not fancy, it's not super complex, it's not one of those heady oriental beauties that just, you know, have a flavor spectrum that is basically endless. It's a traditionally made oolong tea from the heart of Dongding Oolong Tea Country in Fenghuang Village, Lugu Township, Taiwan, harvested on September 4th and uh, roasted a few times and now we're just getting our hands on a bit of it now. Let's just have a second sip here. Very, it has a thick texture to the, to the water, the tea itself, the very smooth and rich, but humble, I would say, in its flavor profile. It's got substance, but it's not trying to blow you away with its fragrant whatever, you know, like, fair enough, a lot of other teas do. It's very satisfying, and it's very substantial, and it's a traditionally made oolong that is difficult to find. A lot of what you get now is something like the Hong Oolong, which is a combination of oolong and black tea. Very distinct in its flavor profile, very delicious. Uh, but if you like that, that balance of uh, ripeness, ripe fruit and bitter, that kind of gives it a clean and lasting finish, then uh, I think you're really going to like this tea. Check it out. Labor of Love Oolong Tea. 2019. We'll see if we get any next year similar to this. Thanks for being with us and uh, hurry up and get some of this.